Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having a beautiful day. And let's say hi to Jay Copley. How are you, Jay? Doing great. Good to see you and everyone. Nice to see you. Welcome. So this month, we are going to be looking at the connection between perception and personal perspective and our own identities. Now, how does perspective shape identity? And also at the importance of maintaining a balanced sense of self that includes not only the body and the mind, but also our spirit or transcendental nature. Now, as most of us know, who we are, this person that we call ourselves, is not a fixed or a static phenomenon. Contrary to what we like to imagine, identity, which derives from the root word for sameness or being the same, is not an indisputable, solid object that's rooted in reality. In fact, identity is a work in progress. It's an evolving creation that arises from an individual's shifting perspective and experience. Now, most of us know this to be the case. The way you see yourself depends entirely on your mood, expectations, biases, judgments, desires, and how you compare yourself to other people. Your angle of vision determines which you you happen to meet in the mirror on any given day. In fact, the mind can be seen as a kind of hall of mirrors. It's a carnival funhouse in which your self-image is twisted and stretched and distorted, never truly reflecting who you are. This dysmorphia applies not only to the physical body, but also to the mental reflection that you carry of your entire being. Thoughts lead you to believe that you are worthy or unworthy, that you're capable or clueless, lovable or hateful, virtuous or sinful. These self-evaluations fluctuate moment by moment, depending on which lens you happen to be looking through. Each of us paints her reality with subjective colors, tinting her perspective with judgments and fears and needs and so on that are unique to her own lived experience. In other words, we're not mere spectators of this inner kaleidoscope, but rather the cinematographers of our own movies. We are the technicians of the cameras that we are looking through. As Ralph Waldo Emerson put it, life is a train of moods like strings of beads. And as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue and each shows only what lies in its focus. Let me repeat that. Life is a train of moods like strings of beads. And as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue, and each shows only what lies in its focus, unquote. That's why it is so imperative to question the mind's distortions and our own psychological dysmorphia, the way we don't see ourselves or who we truly are. The more attention that we pay to understanding our mood train, the more we come to recognize the particular colors of our subjective paint boxes, the casts and hues and shades that our minds reach for when interpreting our experiences. And we all have our own particular paints and collection of colors that we tend to default to. We realize that we have our blind spots as well as parts of ourselves that we tend to highlight. We recognize that self-image is always a distortion as long as we view ourselves through this color panel of our emotions. Because emotions, while containing measures of the truth, are also, as we all know, famously unreliable. Now, to better understand the link between perspective and self-image, it's very helpful to look at developmental psychology and how the identity becomes so entrenched in us. At around 18 months old, Babies begin to perceive themselves as separate individuals, autonomous objects in a world of other objects, some of which offer succor and are loving and are helpful and supportive, and others which uh, oppose them, push them away, and deprive them of what they want. Perceiving herself first in the eyes of others and then in an actual mirrored reflection, the child becomes aware of herself as a thing that seems separate from other things. 
And this impression leads to what Albert Einstein called famously an optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is the cause of all of our sorrows, as we will come to understand. As Einstein put it, a child, quote, experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves, Einstein said, from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty, unquote. Now, language is what enables the child to compose stories to describe herself, stories which appear to reify or make concrete her objectified sense of self. And as time goes on, it becomes harder and harder to separate this story from her sense of identity and who she actually is. With each insistence that the child is this and not that, the child's separation gets deeper and deeper. With each negation, another imaginary boundary is laid between herself and her not self. In other words, identity is based on negation, which causes a permanent fracture in our psychology. With each thought, I am this but not that, the child splits herself in pieces, relegating painful, unwanted, or confusing parts to the realm of the psychological shadow. And this is how she carves herself out of reality, so to speak, as a separate thing in her own mind. Imagining that this daylight identity, the one she shows the world, comprises her whole self, which is, of course, very far from the truth. In fact, a plethora of discarded, denied, undervalued, hidden, avoided experiences have been buried in the not-self. These shadow parts are, in truth, as much an authentic part of who she is as the one that she constructs for herself and the world. And that is why it's so imperative on the path of awakening to excavate the contents of our shadow with love and with care, knowing that they don't define us. And this is a key realization. Knowing that our thoughts and feelings, our self-image don't define us, helps us to maintain the perspective that's necessary for doing the work of self-inquiry. The awareness that this imaginary self composed of the body-mind having experiences in the world is but one facet of our true identity is what liberates us. It's necessary and important to familiarize ourselves thoroughly with this outward self, of course, in coming to understand our own psychology and what makes us tick. But is it the final word on who we are and what we are as whole human beings? Of course not. The bottom line is that we are spiritual beings first and foremost. Our bodies and minds, the physical and mental forms that we treasure, emerge from the formless. They come from the fertile emptiness of the transcendent, the spiritual dimension. In other words, we are both the word and the silence. We are the form and the formlessness. When we forget the silence from which we emerge, and identify solely with the noise in our minds, we wander in ignorance throughout our lives like amnesiacs or like victims of mistaken identity. And that's, of course, how the vast majority of us go through our lives. It's the consensus reality that we have inherited as citizens of this age of scientific materialism. But it is not a view that's based in wisdom or spiritual truth. And what's more, we know this, all of us, in our own deep experience. Most of us are profoundly aware of the transcendent part of ourselves that lives in silence and fullness, far away from the prying eyes of the world. It's the self that's with you when you open your eyes in the morning, before you remember who you are. You know that moment when you open your eyes before consciousness has rushed in to create your identity in your world? You know, when you're simply being? It's the self that's revealed in meditation through moments of rapture in the presence of beauty. But when the mind seems to stop and you're simply there, watching, breathing, feeling communion with the passing spectacle of your life. 
When you learn to rest in these moments and invite them through practice, through ritual, you strengthen this deeper sense of identity that isn't entirely of this world. The identity that isn't bound by your name or your past or the idea of yourself that exists in your head. That self, that larger self, is free and attentive and easeful. It watches the personality self with amusement on good days and with despair on others. This larger self tries to influence the choices of the smaller self. It tucks it, the smaller self, in at night, so to speak. But like any good parent, it learns to stay out of the way. And that's because the spiritual self knows that the personal identity, the ego-bound self, will never be happy. It will never be whole or completely satisfied. Because this little me idea is built on separation, negation, cutting the world into opposites of me, not me. The transcendent self knows all of this all too well. And it also is aware that the ego will reject the spiritual dimension tooth and nail because acknowledging its existence robs the ego of its supremacy. This is extremely important. The ego is our great nemesis, the obfuscating ego, not the healthy ego we need to navigate the world, but the obfuscating ego, the ego that sees itself as the center of the universe. That ego rejects the spiritual. It rejects the transcendent. Because to acknowledge it removes it from its supremacy. It knocks it off the throne of its sort of imagined power. Acknowledging the unity with other beings and with all of creation feels like suicide to the ego, which is why our fortress's identity and the me story are constructed to be so impenetrable. And why the spiritual path is so long. Why this practice of coming to know who we truly are takes a lifetime. If we want to wake up from this ego dream, the most direct way of doing so is to look at things as they actually are, beginning with our own lived experience. So as an exercise, try experimenting with removing this thing that you call your name. Just try it for a moment. The fact of the matter is that this body that you inhabit is nameless and unnameable. You can change the labels, the names, you can adjust the signage, so to speak. You can change the name of the proprietor, but these nominal shifts have no effect whatsoever on the actual property. Just pause to think about this for a moment. Your name and the history that goes with it have nothing to do with your essential being. That being is a mystery. It is undefinable through label or by story. When you look at your eyes in the mirror, the creature looking back at you can never be crammed into a fixed identity or your ideas about it. Self-image is never more than a puny approximation of the wonder of your existence. So just take the time to sit with this awareness, to feel into the lived experience of unfathomable mystery. Allow yourself to experience yourself as present but undefined, vast, encompassing, unencumbered, and also filled with curiosity and love. Ralph Waldo Emerson himself had a transformational experience of this expanded awareness that changed his life. One day he was crossing Boston Common, and he suddenly saw the world through this larger perspective. This is what he said, quote, Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read it again. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. Now, this experience transformed Emerson's life. It became the backdrop of his own insights into human nature. Before this happened, he had been a tormented, self-doubting writer with quite a lot of bitterness about human nature 
and his own character in particular. But after he had this experience, things shifted. The insights remained, including the acknowledgement of how stuck the majority of human beings will choose to remain in their own lives. But the majority of the bitterness was gone, knowing that these flawed human beings were also cosmic entities underneath, that we all are this transparent eyeball, so to speak. When we remove the detritus of the thinking mind and this sense of self that is so blinding to us in our lives. So while it's true that a small minority of the population choose the red pill of revelation over the blue pill of complacency in the matrix of contemporary life, this minority is a powerful one. And it's mostly comprised of a people that we call seekers. Seekers are folks who want to penetrate their surface identity and partake of the larger awareness, that bigger nature within. People who want to step beyond the tiny little me story into the realm of the transcendental. Individuals who make this imaginative leap beyond the confines of their personal myth, either voluntarily through practice or involuntarily through some kind of crisis or adversity, come to see how arbitrary their personal fictions actually are. They come to perceive how their minds create stories automatically in the same way that a bird creates song and apples grow out of an apple tree. Awakened from the sleep of the small self, the seeker finally comes to recognize her fictions as fictions, which gives her the freedom to change them. She learns to integrate her spiritual awareness into the characters she plays in the world, which allows her to play her roles with more freedom, more passion, more elan, knowing that they don't define her. And that's a paradox. Many people think, oh, if I connect to my spiritual nature, I'm going to lose what's particular and unique about me. But of course, that's not the case at all. When we're aware of the transcendent behind us, we're not as attached and we can play with more freedom and more imagination and more creativity. In fact, we grow far less afraid of losing faith or face and sacrificing our reputation. So when we're severed from the belief in a separate will-generated self, we know that we are subject to universal laws and forces that are far beyond our reckoning. That's really the point. We're fluid, changeable, adapting, evolving, and impermanent. And this insight into how we create identity changes how we relate to our own minds. We're no longer duped by our personalized narratives into mistaking ourselves for the, the composed self, the narrative self, the tiny little me fiction. So ask yourself, how does perception affect your sense of identity? Do you factor in the spiritual when it comes to your self-image? Are you aware of the particular colors of your mind, the way you tend to frame and shade experience? Do you view yourself through a glass darkly, or do you tend to give yourself the benefit of the doubt? Are you trapped in narratives that are based on false assumptions or past experiences that are harmful or self-hating or irrelevant? And finally, when you look at your life through the eyes of love, seeing yourself as God or the Buddha mind might see you. How does that change your relationship to yourself and what seems possible for you? So, Jay, why don't we pull up the card and do a little bit of writing? Here we go. I'd like you now, please, to take 20 minutes to write about which aspects of your so-called identity are based on cover-ups, fantasies, or misperceptions. Which aspects of your identity, your self-image, seem to be based on cover-ups, on fantasies, misperceptions, or out-and-out lies? Be as specific as you can be, please. Ten minutes in, Jay will open up the breakout rooms if you'd like to join a group. Otherwise, just keep on writing. 20 minutes. <laughs> 